Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to today's partner web conference. This is Fast Track for Dynamics 365 for Finance and Operations Tech Talk. Today's topic, Microsoft Managed Continuous Updates. My name is Janice and I'm going to be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your PC speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. If you do not consent to be a part of a recorded session, we ask that you please disconnect now. Attendees may access the web conference recording within 72 hours via the same registration link that was used to attend today's live broadcast. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, you can turn on the Q&A panel by selecting the question mark icon located in the upper right hand corner of your screen. We do have presenters standing by to answer your questions throughout the session. Now, presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Principal Program Manager, Shelly Bach. So without any further delay, Shelly, welcome and thanks for joining us. Wonderful, thank you, Janice. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day so far. Thanks for joining our webcast about the continuous updates. Um, our continuous update session that we're gonna talk about today is really all gonna be about finance and operations. So let's start in going deep as far as what the experience looks like. Now we have had this discussion several times already. What we're gonna talk about today is really our key principles, how we think about those principles, as well as show you a demo for some of the features and functionality that is starting to light up within lifecycle services. I do have some colleagues here that are also watching and helping with questions, so please feel free to ask questions throughout the session, but we will wait until the end um, if there are any for an open Q&A. Okay, so let's get started on what we're talking about today. From a continuous update cadence perspective, we also talk about this as being called one version, getting all of our customers on our ecosystem as a Dynamics 365 product all on one version. We've got two key pillars for this, and this is really all about the predictability and making sure that those updates are continuous in nature. Now, when we're talking about one version and we're talking about having customers on the latest product version, this is actually something for finance and operations that we have been doing for just about a year now. And we started on this journey with finance and operations, in particular with the platform. So we started updating customers to the latest platform and helping them keep current on the platform. We also, as we released version 8.1, which was released in October, that is when we also started doing the continuous updates that included the platform and the application. And that is just a huge mind shift and change for how we can take these huge ERP product of finance and operations and be able to actually keep the application updated as well too. When we look at our service update principles, now keep in mind when we're now on this on this journey of 8.1, which really bleeds into version 10, we are now calling the updates a service update. And that's because the service update includes application components as well as platform components. So it is your entire finance and operations system, which also includes the retail HQ components, as well as management reporter as well. Two huge pillars that we talk about. The first one is it's all about the quality. It's all about making sure that these service updates that are gonna be continuous in nature and predictable for you as a customer have high quality and meet those quality standards. The first pillar on this really talks about backward compatibility. And this is probably the one that is the most controversial, I would say maybe on this slide, because our customers and our ecosystem are used to having Microsoft release an update. You as a customer, as an existing customer that was on 2009, AX 2012, or any of the earlier versions of finance and operations, you as the customer then have had to do a lot of work to really be able to take that update and be able to apply it to your system. 
also from our ecosystem, our ISVs, they as well had a lot of work that they needed to do. And that was primarily because of how our customizations were done. We moved away with version 8.1 Actually, it was with 8.0. We moved away from the ability for you to over layer your customizations and we moved to an extensibility model. Now, having this extensibility model, as well as a lot of the capabilities that we have in place, such as a compatibility checker, additional validations for our ISVs in particular, help us to ensure backward compatibility. So gone should be the days of a customer saying or hearing from an ISV that they need to wait three to four weeks after Microsoft has released the update until they're ready to take it. When we think of backward compatibility, our commitment to you is to say that in your environment as it exists today, you can take a service update and it's going to work. Along the lines with quality, we also have a lot of validations that we do from a ring perspective, and we have different programs, such as the customer release validation program. Both of these bullets I'm gonna hold on and going to much detail right now because I have a few slides that will go through them for us. We also talked about how we've enabled extension points, which has really been our key driver for how we can now do updates and not upgrades. So we no longer have heavy, expensive upgrades. We're moving into a world of a one version type of an experience where it is a service update. Also, a huge key win for us is that all of these updates are cumulative service updates. When we think about our customers that are on AX 2012 or AX 2009, where you were able to pick and choose your individual hot fixes, I can guarantee you that I do not have a lab set up in our Microsoft Office that exactly matches the exact combination that you chose. Because of that, we wanted to help ensure the quality of these updates, which means that the updates are always cumulative in nature. So another way to flip that is to say that there is no longer the ability to pull an individual KB or an individual hotfix. Now the customer is in control. This is where, as I talked about, how we have been doing these updates for just about a year now. You as the customer, you really weren't in control you didn't have a lot of predictability. You would get an email from Microsoft saying, hey, in seven days or five days, we want to update your environment. Sometimes that worked for you, sometimes it didn't work for you. So then you had the option to, of course, always opt out of those updates. Now, you as the customer are in control. So we're gonna talk about these next bullets, um, one, two, and three, which is the configurated update window. This is now available in Lifecycle Services. We're also gonna talk in detail about how you can pause an update. So just because this is a, a, a hot topic for our community, let's talk about the principle on pausing an update now. And then once we get into the product, we'll see a demo on it as far as how it works. These service updates are going to be made available monthly. So Microsoft is going to be releasing a monthly update. You as the customer have the option to pause up to three updates. This means, this equates to that you cannot be more than three updates behind. So you can only skip two updates and then you need to make sure you get current. So we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. We'll also show this, talk about mandatory updates and what that means as well. These service updates are going to include hot fixes, but they're also going to include new features and functionality. If you go and take a look at our release notes, you see in our release notes where we have a lot of the detail about what we are going to be releasing. And a lot of that functionality, some of it will be coming in May, June, July, which means 
that that's going to be coming in the service update we're going to be making available at that time frame. Now, when we talk about the new features, <clears throat> a key principle for us, and I have some slides on this as well, is to make sure that your user experience does not change as a result of the new feature being implemented. Another way to say this is you as the customer are always in control for when you want to enable the new feature and functionality. We also have programs that are available from a customer perspective where you can get preview access to the builds. We'll talk about those in just a little bit as well. And then for anything that we may be deprecating. Now, in the sense that we're talking about deprecation, notice here, this means the items that we are going to say that we are no longer going to support and they may get removed from the product. So an example here would be, let's say we introduced a new API. We had an existing API out there in the system. We introduced a new API. If we want to deprecate that old API, which we know that there's customers using, you're going to have a minimum of 12 months notice before that old API is deprecated. Now you're going to be able to see what we are deprecating here in our docs.microsoft.com page, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. And it's key and important for you to know that any deprecation will happen in the April or the October timeframe. We have downtime. Today there is downtime. We have downtime, which is approximately a 30 minute downtime for the service update to be applied. So when you go to configure your maintenance window, you will need to choose a downtime. Now we are moving away from downtime to get to zero downtime. Our goal is by the end of the calendar year of 2019, that's when we should be getting towards zero downtime. Now with all of these service updates, we talked about how there's new functionality. We talked about how there's hot fixes. You probably want to know, well, how can I test these? What do I need to do in order to be able to see and understand how this is going to impact my environment? So we have some tools available. We have a regression test tool available, and we also have a data task testing tool available. The regression test tool is available for your business users in order to be able to record a business process and then play that back in an automated fashion. The data task testing tool has a ton of capability, but one of the capabilities for that tool is to also help testing with integrations. And then the last one that we have is the update impact analyzer. And this allows you to look at how does a particular update impact your environment. Okay, let's move into a little bit more on the quality aspect and our safe deployment practice. Now, from a Microsoft standard perspective and typical Microsoft cloud solutions, as well as cloud solutions from our competition as well, when they look at a safe deployment, they typically roll out a safe deployment by an Azure region by Azure region. For our ERP solution, we're making our safe deployment practice a little bit differently, where we are giving you, the customer, the ability to control when you take that update. First, it all starts with ring zero and ring one. Ring zero and ring one, this is the Microsoft ring. This is where our engineering team is frantically working on building those new functionality that we want to deliver to you so you can get greater value from your system. We also are working on those hot fixes that you have reported. So all of that is happening in ring zero and ring one. We also have extensive compatibility checker that we've built out. And this is where you see this customer release validation program that I'll talk about again in just a little bit. Now, when we move into ring two, ring two is what we call our preview ring. This is where we have a program. It's called the Preview Early Access Program. And this program is open for ISVs, customers, partners, anyone really that has a Dynamics 365 product. This allows you to get the first look of that service update. 
Now, because this is in preview, you cannot take this to production. So this is meant for you to be used in a dev test environment, just for you to simply do validation. Maybe there's new feature functionality you want to be looking at. When you look at these preview builds, they are only for that, just preview testing. Ring three, this is our first experience on when we are going to be taking customers with this service update that is production ready to implement it into their sandbox and then implementing it into the production environment. Now you can think of Ring 3 as first release. You can also think of it, if you guys have been around a while, as what we used to have as the old TAP program. These are our early adopters. These are the technology adoption program, the customers that are going to take it first. This is an opportunity for customers to take the update, like I said, from Sandbox all the way to production. Is complete production ready? Now, customers that are a part of the first release program, they get special attention, I should say, from our Microsoft R&D team. We have a dedicated group and a team of people that are monitoring their environments as well as replying to any issues that they have that they come with. So anything that a first release customer has, this comes to us directly in R&D. The next one is Ring 4, and this is our standard release. This is now where that predictability comes for you as the customer in order to be able to go ahead and manage exactly when you want that update to be applied to your environment. Now, we will always apply to the UAT environment first and then to production. And keep in mind when I'm talking about us applying the update, that simply means if you choose to have Microsoft auto apply. Let's talk about this release validation program and what it means. Now the release validation program is critical for us at the quality aspect on it. What we do from a release validation program is we want to work with our customers. Now at this point in time, when I say customers, it very well means also ISVs. Um, what we do is we ask for the customer to provide us with a copy of your data, a copy of your deployable package, which would include any of your customizations, and a copy of all of your automated tests that are synced to a business process model library. We set this up in a separate lifecycle services project. There's no financial cost to the customer to participate in this program because Microsoft is hosting this particular environment on our subscription. But what we what we have the ability to do now is in that lifecycle services project, when we are in ring zero and ring one and we are developing that update, we apply that update while it's still in development into this LCS project. Then we run the else then we run all of the automated tests and the customer whose environment we're running this on can clearly see any pass or fail now i talk about this in terms of financial cost to the customer we do work very closely with the customer in order to help us get the environment set up because you as the customer we want you to choose the right data set that you want to provide to Microsoft. Um, you, we do not have tools for anonymizing the data, so you as the customer are in charge of anonymizing the data. You also, as the customer, are also then required to make sure that if you make any substantial changes to your environment, that you go ahead and refresh that into the LCS project. Now, as part of the program, we're asking for you to make sure things are updated about once every six months. But there is a cost, so to speak, on just the helping of setting up that environment. But there is no financial cost to the customer. New features. These are some guiding principles. Just like we have guiding principles for all of our service updates, we have three key guiding principles that we need to think about when we introduce new functionality or new features to our customers. The first one is we cannot change a user's existing experience. 
The second, we need to give the customer the ability to control the adoption. You roll it out on your time frame, your internal change management, and we need a way for you as the customer to really know what are these new features without having to try to dig through some documentation online. So what you're gonna see here is what we are planning for the future. It's not in the product today. Our current plan for this is about the June, July-ish timeframe in that update. But let's walk through what that experience will look like. The first thing you're gonna notice is there's a new workspace called Feature Management. This workspace called Feature Management will do your introduction into the new features that are being made available as part of the update. When you look at the new features, particular in this one, the views, you can see exactly the release that it was made available in. And when you look at the right side of the screen, you can see if it is configured. You can also see a lot of the great information about if you wanted to learn more, now it takes you directly to that documentation where you're not having to hunt and peck around in docs.microsoft.com to try to find it. You can also see the roles that would be affected by you enabling this particular, this particular feature functionality. Now you can use this as a great list to say, okay, these are the people I need to go and train. It also is a good way for you to just make sure you've got that full visibility on who will be impacted. The last one is a comments box, and this box is really just for you people internally looking at this workspace to say if you have multiple sys admins, maybe someone might say, hey, let's try this out. Someone else might want to come out and put a comment and say, no, not till June. We've got a lot of work going on. Now, when you want to configure it, you can at the bottom go ahead and do the configuration as per the setup steps, and then you can mark it as being configured. Once it is marked as being configured, you can clearly see in the workspace overview that that feature functionality is configured. We talked about how we want to do an introduction to these new features as well too, to the users, similar to how our office updates are. I just loaded an office update earlier this week and I got to see some of the new feature functionality in Outlook. So very similar to this, if there are user experiences that the user can then turn on themselves, we want to make sure those users are aware of it. Okay, let's talk about the four pillars of the one version update experience. The first one is onboarding. So I'm going to go in and show you in just a little bit here what the onboarding experience looks like in Lifecycle Services. This is where you as the customer are in control of when you're going to take that update. The next one is the notice. When are you going to be notified of an update being made available? Now, in the past, what we have done is we have relied very heavily on email and we're not going to let up on that. We're still going to be doing email notifications. So if you have people in your organization that are not getting notified of when an update is being planned for your environment, you can go ahead and add them into the project settings so that way they will get these notifications. What we're also going to be doing though is we've also created what is called an action center. And in that action center is when you can see when the update is available. So now you don't have to go out to a Yammer group or you don't have to subscribe to a blog. Right in Lifecycle Services is when you're gonna see the notification. And right before your update is going to, or excuse me, right before your environment is going to be updated, you'll also see a toast notification that's going to be made available in LCS. The execution of the service updates. A lot of what we've been talking about has really been about Microsoft applying the update. But please keep in mind, you as a customer are in control. You can take this update anytime you want. The only rule to keep in mind is that you cannot be more than two consecutive updates behind, sorry, three consecutive updates behind. You can only pause two consecutive updates. So we're asking customers to take a minimum of four service updates a year, where as the customer, you can choose to pause or delay up to two 
at a time in a consecutive manner. So if you have not chosen to take the updates, and if you have chosen to pause those two consecutive updates, that is then when Microsoft will auto update. Now I have another slide, I think it's shortly right after this, or once we get into the experience, when we actually talk versions and we kind of start to map things out from a version perspective. And then the last pillar is, of course, the validate. Validate is optional to you. We highly recommend it, but it is optional for you to do. We'll talk about the impact analyzer. Data task automation, like I said, is available for integrations. And then we have our RSAT tool, which is that no-code automation test tool. Okay, let's go in and look at the experience that we have available in LCS. Now I've got several different LCS projects pulled up here and each of them gives us a little bit something that we want to take a look at. The first is really all about how do you know when that update is available? You're gonna know it's available here by looking at the Action Center. So as soon as that update is available for all of our standard release customers, they're gonna be able to see it in the Action Center. You can save the update, which is going to take it and save it to your asset library within this LCS project, or you can go ahead and go to what's new, which will take you to our documentation site. When I take a look at the project settings for a particular environment, now looking at this, I've got my LCS project. What I've done was clicked it on my little hamburger over here, and I said I wanted to go to project settings. We have introduced an update settings. Now, this is not there for absolutely everyone yet. I want to be clear on that. So the update settings is available first for customers that are on 8.1. Now, if you are a customer and you just recently moved to an 8.1 release and you do not see the update settings, you will be seeing it soon. We run a batch job periodically to make sure that we're updating the customers, particularly for 8.1, in order to be able to see the update experience. Now we've been talking about one version, we've been talking about all of this. This still applies to those customers that have an exception to stay on 7.3 because of our lifecycle support policy. Maybe perhaps Microsoft was not able to deliver the extension point that they needed. In that case, those customers have the exception to still be on 7.3, which means we will continue to update the platform. So by keeping our customers current, not only on version 10, but also on the prior versions, the customers with the platform, in the April timeframe, all customers will be able to see these update settings. And so the update settings are going to be applying for everyone, for the customers on version 8.1 and version 10, as well as customers on older versions of finance and operations. If you are on an older version, the update that you're going to be getting is going to be a platform update. Let's go through the details on the update settings. The first one is your sandbox. You get to choose the sandbox, the tier two sandbox that you want Microsoft to deploy this to. This is giving you more control. In the past, Microsoft has chosen the sandbox based on what was available from your subscription. Now you have the ability to select that sandbox. You also have a cadence here. You could choose the first, second, or third week of the month. Now remember, this is when Microsoft will auto apply that update. If you are a retail customer, for example, and you want, your, you want to have your um, updates applied on the Tuesday, you can do that. You can still do that in the same manner as you've been able to apply updates in the past. This is just stating that when Microsoft is going to apply that update, you could choose when you want that update applied. Now from here, you can also choose the time zone, you could choose the days of the week, and you could choose a time slot. This is a question I think I saw come through about the time slot. So we are having a three hour time window, even though it's a 30 minute time to update your environment. 
This is to make sure and ensure that we are updating all of the customers that have selected that time period by that time frame. Now, as you see us get more efficient, we will be able to be knocking this time slot down. Also, as you see, and based on feedback that we're going to be getting from the customers, you will start to see more opportunities for time zone and more opportunities for days of the week. But keep in mind, this is really all about when the auto update will be applied. You can still manually apply your update at any time you want, and maybe you may never ever have Microsoft auto apply an update to your environment because of how you have everything configured. Now, one of the beauties, again, is really making sure that you guys know when these updates are coming. And here's a great example of being able to see the update calendar. The update calendar is now showing you the predictability. Now, I, I completely know and understand that it's not always showing everything all the way out to the future. We're working to enable more all the time. But at the start, you'll be able to at least get a good glimpse on what we are going to be doing from an update perspective. Now, I picked this particular LCS project, and, and you can see that it's a test project. So we've been doing a lot of playing around with it and what have you. But I picked this one particularly for a reason, because this project, as you see, does not have a production environment deployed. So the concept of one version, the concept of staying current applies throughout your implementation, not just once you are live. So that's very key to remember. The concept of making sure all customers are current with all the service updates is applying throughout the implementation and then of course, once you are live. Now at this point in time, you'll be able to see the status of a particular update. This particular one, when we were playing around with the system, we said we wanted to cancel this one. If you were to pause an update, let's talk about how that works. I could come over here and choose my slider to say, yes, I want to pause an update. Now, when you pause an update, there is a price to be paid. When you pause an update, we will not be able to guarantee zero downtime. So zero downtime is, once we get to zero downtime, zero downtime will only be guaranteed for the customers that stay on the monthly continuous updates. If you pause an update, we will not be able to guarantee the zero downtime. Now, if I wanted to come in here and look at how I could actually edit the particular pausing of the environment, this is where I see I have the ability to come out and choose if I want to pause an update or not. Now, it may be kind of hard to see um, through the meeting invite, but I want you to note that some of these boxes are light gray and some of them are dark gray. The dark gray means that those are ones you can choose to pause. The dark gray means that you cannot pause those yet because this comes back to the principle, remember, of Microsoft is asking you to stay current with updates. We're asking you to take a minimum of four service updates a year, and you will not be able to pause more than two consecutive updates at a time. Now, we have had feedback from customers, and we are looking to enable a little bit more flexibility in this. For example, custom, the feedback has been, I'm a customer, I want to sit down and plan my yearly updates. So I want to plan that I'm going to pause June and July and I'm going to pause October I'm going to pause October and November. Right now you can't go and pause October and November. We're only allowing you to pause the next two that are consecutive. Um, but we have heard the feedback and we are looking at allowing more flexibility in this in the future. Okay, let's jump back to our presentation because I've got a little slide here that talks about what is possible with pausing of an update. Okay, so in this example, we've got, let's use the first one where we have a customer here that is on 8.1, and this I have highlighted in yellow. If a customer is on 8.1 today, it's actually 8.1.1, sorry, essentially, they have paused 8.1.2 
and paused 8.1.3. This customer that is on 8.1.1 is going to be forced to update to version 10. And by saying forced to be update to version 10 means that you will not be able to pause the version 10 update within the user interface. Now, if you're an 8.1.1 customer, you have version 10 available, you've been testing it, version 10 is out there, you find something that is at the last minute that you cannot take to production because it is a production impacting bug, submit a support case. Get that SEVA support case submitted and we will work with you to ensure that your environment is not updated for a bug that could potentially be damaging for your production. So we have mechanisms that we will make sure that if there are issues that prevent you from taking it to production, please let us know. We need to know that through the mechanism of our support team. And we need to know the details on what that issue is that you are facing. That way we can make sure we get that issue fixed, we get the fix out there for you, and then you can make sure to take then that cumulative update on a self-update cadence, so that way you are current. And this again is just showing the example here. If I'm a customer and I'm currently on version 10 today, I can pause 10.1 and 10.2. I will not be able to pause 10.3. 10.3 will be required for me to take. On the execute side, we've talked a lot about the auto apply. Auto apply is great. Auto apply can be done as you saw in mass to customers because you guys are selecting the weekend, the time zone, but please don't forget that you don't have to have Microsoft auto deploy it for you. You can choose to deploy it at your time. And here is where you would go in your environment, maintain and go ahead and apply the update. Now, an example of where this comes into play today, you as a customer have the ability to have a package that is pending sign off. And if a package is pending sign off, Microsoft today will not deploy an automatic update to that environment. So in that case, and a lot of times some people know, don't know that that package is pending sign off. So you get the update then saying that Microsoft is not able to apply this update to your environment. You won't be able to just go and reschedule when that update will get auto applied. What you need to do then is come out here and choose to maintain and apply that update yourself. And this is when you could choose to apply that update any day of the week, any time of the week. But this is your ability to be in control on when that update is applied. The auto update experience that we have from Microsoft is based on that schedule that you see in the update settings. We already talked about from an auto update component, we're still gonna make sure we go through the notification. You're gonna be notified at a minimum of five days before we update your pre-production, which is your UAT environment. Then we give you seven days by the time your pre-production environment is updated to the time production is updated. And what should you do with those seven days? If you're having Microsoft do um, all of the auto update, that's when you should look at your validation. So the first validation aspect I wanna talk about is that impact analysis. How do you know how your environment is going to be impacted as a result of this update? Well, we've got a tool that's going to be coming out soon called the Update Impact Analyzer. Now, in looking at the concepts that you see here, there's some dark green bubbles that go in the a vertical line, and then we've got a couple bubbles on the horizontal axis there. From the vertical axis, what we really are looking to do is making sure you know the code churn that is introduced as a part of that release. You also have an understanding from a module perspective, how is your how is your ownership and use of the product applied by a module? And then you'll also be able to see based on the size of the bubble, which you'll see in a little bit, how heavy is the user interaction on that particular module? So coming out the gates, 
in the June July time frame, you're going to get this and you're going to get this in lifecycle services where you're going to be able to choose the service update, get an understanding on how it impacts your environment. The next question people have been asking is what about my ISVs? Can I get my ISVs so I could see their code churn as well? And because I'm going to be doing all of this automated testing, can I see how my task recordings and my test my test cases really overlay and have an impact on what has been provided in this update. So those two bullets are the bullets on the horizon axis and those bullets will be coming in the future. Let's take a look at what the report looks like. The report is called the impact update impact analyzer report and at what you could see up here at the very top is you could choose the actual release that you want to have a comparison on how that release looks within your environment. You could see the different file types on the right. You could see also here the actual code churn that has happened. So here I've got the usage and churn, I've got usage and a full change list from this Power BI report. Now what you see here in the middle, the first is those user interactions. I can see how I'm using the system. Here I'm using cash management, I'm using inventory, and I'm using warehouse and transportation. I can tell by the access of my user interactions that I'm using inventory way more than I am retail. So you could tell it by not only on the scale of that, that access, your user interactions, then we can also overlay what is the code churn and how has that code churn really been impacted by your usage and the modules that you're using within that environment. So let's take a look at this example. We can see that as a result of this particular update, there were a lot of updates that came out from the um, localization team in terms of tax. There may have been some localization requirements that were required. So because of that, that new code has been introduced into this particular update. I'll be able to see all of the details of that here below, but by looking at it at the visual, I can see that I'm really not using anything about localization taxes, but it has a lot of code churn. You can then make a decision on if you need to go ahead and do any additional validation on this particular area of the product. Now, what I also want to call out is don't overlook anything down here in this lower corner. Even though it can have a low user interaction and even though it can have a low code churn, it can be something that can be so absolutely critical to your business. Maybe it just happens once a month or once every six months. You still need to make sure that you are taking the proper due diligence to do your base coverage that you need. The next tool that we have available is our RSAT tool, and this is our uh, regression suite automation tool. This is the tool that allows you as an end user to go ahead and Author a, author a test case or a task using Task Recorder. Task Recorder has been available for quite some time since we shipped the product with AX7. And so I can go ahead and record this test. I could save it to my business process modeler and I can sync it to my Azure DevOps in order to create a test plan and test suites. Now this, these tests can be run as data agnostic, and you can rerun these tests on different companies and different data sets, because what we have done is decoupled parameter and data from the actual test. Now, once you go ahead and execute these tests, you have a beautiful report that is available for you again in Azure DevOps, where then you're able to look at that report and get an understanding on what had passed and what had failed. Now, recording the test using the RSAT tool is a requirement for joining that program I talked about earlier, which is that release validation program. That release validation program, again, is the program where you as the customer will provide Microsoft with a set of your data, your test, and your, uh, your software deployable package, which includes your customizations and any ISVs. 
And we as Microsoft run that as a part of our validation in the development cycle. So we do require and we do rely heavily on the RSAT test for this. Now, I do know that there are several great solutions in the community. There's a lot of tools out there that help with automated testing. You're not required to use this tool, but this is the tool that we currently have available. And this is the tool that we um, do require to be a part of the release validation program. Okay, the last slide is really talking about resources. But before we go to that slide, I want to point out for you what we have done on our docs.microsoft.com page. We hopefully have made this resource section a lot easier for you to come out and find and get your questions answered. So going to docs.microsoft.com for finance and operations, we now have a table of contents that is specifically for our one version service updates. This is where you can go and look at the FAQ. What we do as a part of the FAQ, and I see that there's a lot of questions coming in here, which is fantastic. What we do as part of our all of these sessions that we deliver is we go back and reference our FAQ. If the document or the question is not answered in that document, we go ahead and make sure that it does get answered and it does get updated. So always please make sure you're going out and looking at the FAQ. We also have our software lifecycle policy as it relates to cloud and on-prem. And this is another good reminder as far as these service updates and how are these service updates impacting our customers that are currently deploying on-premise. The software lifecycle policy is exactly the same. The only difference between cloud and on-prem is that from an on-premise perspective, Microsoft will not auto apply the update. So a customer is still expected while being on-prem to take a minimum of four service updates a year, and they still have the ability to delay up to two consecutive updates at a time. We have a new, um, new link out here called the service update availability. The service update availability, this gives us a little discussion about our release processes, which we talked about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down here for a little bit. And what I want to point out to you is what we have as a targeted release schedule. Now, full, full disclosure, and I'll own this as well, it's a little wishy because it does say, if we think about our preview program, you can expect this particular update to be week of, this particular update to be week of. That might mean Monday, that might mean Tuesday, that might mean Wednesday, but what we're putting out here is our plan for the week as far as when you guys should be able to see that update or get that update. The other key component I wanna pull out here or talk about is when we talk about the auto update schedule, we talk about how we are going to auto update the sandbox. You have seven days for validation and then we're gonna auto update the production environment. Based on feedback we've received from customers, seven days is not enough. So what we have done is we are making that update available for you to pull, which is self update at any time. So if we look at the update here of 10.0.1 or the update of platform update 25, during the week of April 8th is really when you as a customer would be able to come out and pull that update. Now remember, you're gonna be notified of that update in your LCS project. Uh, let's use this one. In your LCS project in the action center. So as soon as 10.0.1 is available, and again, this is a test one, so that's why it's showing like it is, but it's not really yet. As soon as it's available, that's when you will come out and be able to save it to your own shared or to your own asset library. This is now giving you as the customer much more time for validation. This is giving you the time to make sure that you don't have just seven days. You have almost an additional two, sometimes three weeks. And then we also talk about how you can apply updates to the cloud because this isn't just about Microsoft auto applying it. It's about you also being able to apply the updates on your schedule. And then everything else that we talked about today about how to configure, how to pause, how to get notified, 
using the test tools that we have available is also here as well as a resource. So again, this is available on docs.microsoft.com. When you go to finance and operations, it's part of the overview and it just lists right out here the one version service update. Now, if I can go back to the slide and I'll just keep this last slide up, um, you guys are gonna get access to the slide deck that you can download. This has a ton of links on it. So there's a ton of links out here where you guys can go and get any of these particular resources. It's just in the end, I know it's probably a pretty ugly slide to look at, um, but it's available for you. Okay, with that, that gives us about 10 minutes for some Q&A. So I am gonna go ahead and there's been a lot of questions that have been asked. And I know the team, my colleagues, Sagita and Martin have been feverishly helping to answer some of the questions. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, one question I see out here is, it, this isn't talking about the new feature functionality roles um, or that new feature role that we're going to be adding. Um, if that new feature is going to be affected by a custom role. And yes, we will be able to show you that if the new feature that we are rolling out is created by a new custom role that you created, if the code that we are rolling out is included in a particular security role, whether that be custom or out of the box, that role and that user will show up in the list. Um, what's the definition of a weekend when it comes and looks at our particular update cadence? Uh, the definition of a weekend we are hoping is really a weekend within your local time zone. Now, you do have the option to choose different time zones. Um, you do have the option also of choosing, when we think about a customer in the APAC region, for example, and I'm based in North America, the customer in the APAC region, their updates are really happening for them Saturday and Sunday, even though for our, for our experiences up here in North America, we know that they're happening on our Friday. So we are looking at a weekend of being Saturday and Sunday for the updates. If we run into a major issue after an update, do we have an option to roll back or how do we get emergency fixes? So from a rollback perspective, we will be doing rollback only at that initial time of deploying the update. So if the update for whatever reason fails, we will roll that update back and you will be notified. You'll get a communication, an email communication. You'll get an email communication stating that the update had failed and your environment has been rolled back to the original state. Now, if you are working in that environment and you run into a major issue, we do have ways that we can get emergency fixes. Now, these emergency fixes, remember, are going to be cumulative, but we're going down the path of fix fast versus roll back after you've already been working and you have a lot of transactions and you have a lot of updates already happening in the environment. So the rollback concept is gonna happen at the time of the service update being applied. If there's any issues when that service update was applied, that is then when we will choose to roll back if an update or if an issue was found. If after you have been running on the product, we will fix fast. Why is the fourth weekend not available? Um, this, was a, this was a decision that we made as the leadership team. Um, the decision as a leadership team is for the updates to take place the first, second, or third week of the month. Um, there's really no other rhyme or reason outside of just thinking about customers towards that last weekend of the month, preparing for month end. Now, we also know and understand that month end a lot of times happens for customers the first weekend of the month, which is perfectly fine. It allows you then to choose the second or third weekend for the update. There's a, another question that came in from doing the configuration that they can only see Saturday as the day of the week. And this is the part where we are getting, that is correct, 
um, for depending on what you select in your time zone, you may only be able to see at this time one day. We are going to be working to expanding that. Um, at this point in time, that would be the day of the week for the update to apply by Microsoft. Um, if you want it another day of the week, that's then when you could go ahead and manually apply it yourself by going to that environment, choosing maintain and applying the update. We are working though, we have heard this feedback that people want the auto update experience to be scheduled and to happen and they want to have more than just the one or two days. So this is something that we are looking at enabling in the future as well. Um, let's see, if I'm already on version 10, will I be updated anyway in April? If yes, what would you get? Um, the database, the sandbox will be updated as well. Okay, this is a great question. So if you have already taken the update, and let's think about this true in terms of a standard safe deployment practice. A standard safe deployment practice does not have us modifying the package that is being rolled out to the customers. It's the same package that is being rolled out to all customers. So if you have already updated your environment to version 10, Microsoft will not update your environment again because you are already on that version. You're already on that latest. Now, this is a great question and I appreciate it because I actually forgot to bring something up here. When you are on a particular environment, now that we are in this whole cumulative service update, the great news is that you only have one tile that's available. So when you are looking at your environment in your LCS project, if you're on a prior version, you saw a lot of tiles and really they were confusing. Was it a platform on the application? Was it a platform component binaries? Was it an application X plus plus fix? What is it? There are so many different tiles. That confusion has gone away. If you are on version 10 and you have a one tile experience, you may see that tile number increment. You may see that tile is four, and then you may see that tile is six. What that tile number is telling you is that Microsoft has released what we are deeming as critical fixes for that update. Now, you as a customer, you and we have the same experience as we have before where you see the KB number, you can look in lifecycle services issue search on what is all addressed with that fix. But now you are the one that determines if you want to take that and apply it to your environment. If we as Microsoft also see that there is something absolutely critical that we want you to know about and we want you to pull that update, then we will communicate with you. You will get an email from us saying that there is a critical hotfix. Our telemetry has indicated that you would benefit from this hotfix. Please go to your tile experience and deploy. So we will do multiple different communications with you based off the telemetry needs. Do these updates apply to cloud hosted environments? No, they do not. Um, these updates and the fact that we are going to auto update at this time only impact the sandbox UAT and the production environment. Now, this brings up another great question as well, too. And this question I want to address in terms of the Tile Action Center experience. I'm sure we have a lot of partners and a lot of ISVs that are on a call or maybe even customers that are using what we have available as our 18 month trial offer. And that 18 month trial offer, that is really where you leverage and use cloud hosted environments instead of what you see here as all of your environments on the right side in your LCS project. If you have an LCS project that is using that 18 month trial experience, meaning it is not an implementation project, you will not see the Action Center. So the Action Center is only available for customer projects that are implementation type projects. For partners, ISVs, what you guys need to do is you need to look at that service update schedule that we posted and made available 
and you'll be able to get that update through your shared asset library. So at this point in time, we've not enabled the action center for the non-implementation projects. All right, with that being said, that takes us right up to the hour. Uh, there's lots of great questions out here. We will continue to go through them. And as I said, we will make sure and update our FAQ for anything that may not be there already. I want to thank my colleagues, Sagita and Martin, for helping to answer questions throughout the meeting. And with that, Janice, I'll turn it over to you for any last minutes. All right. Thank you, Shelley. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring your attention to a link that I just posted in the Q&A panel. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference. We ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful. And if you enjoyed today's web conference, have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, or you'd like to submit topics for future web conferences, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from one to five with five being the highest score possible. And that is going to conclude today's web conference. Attendees can access the web conference recording via the same registration link that was used to attend today's live broadcast. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Shelley, and thank you audience for logging in and joining us today.